Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellen Vaughn, and I head up EESI's uh, buildings work. We promote uh, policies and practices to make our building sector more sustainable and resilient. Uh, and I have the honor this morning of introducing and moderating our two buildings panels. And the reason we have two buildings panels, um, first of all, we're delighted to have you all here and thank you for um, exhibiting um, and, and talking about the building sector. Because the building sector, uh, for those of you who might uh, not know, uh, consumes about 40% of our energy. Uh, nearly 75% of our electricity and is responsible for about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a significant part of the economy as well as um, a contributor to, uh, to our energy and environmental issues. The good news is that buildings are becoming much more sustainable and resilient. That is, they're using less energy, um, less uh, and more renewable energy uh, consuming fewer natural resources for construction and operation, uh, and providing greater comfort, safety, durability, um, and functionality for the occupants. Um, and that's because of a combination of factors. We have, uh, it, it's all of the things coming together. It's R&D, uh, government and industry innovation, consumer knowledge and demand, codes and standards, financing, public policies, and training of uh, building professionals, architects, engineers, and builders. It's all those things that are, that are necessary. And on our panel, uh, we have, uh, it, it's really the individuals who are leading the way that we have most to thank for this. And we have some of um, the, the leaders in this space on our panel. So I am delighted to first start with uh, um, a home builder uh, who has made it a priority to build homes that use fewer natural resources and at the same time are awesome for the people who buy them and live there. So thank you for being here, Kier. Kier de Grand Jean, I want to always say it in the French way, um, with uh, High Performance Homes. Welcome and come on up. Thanks, Alice. Again, thank you very much. This is my uh, third year in a row, and uh, I look forward to every year. Uh, this is such a powerful environment, uh, the, the best minds, the best people out here. So just to give you a little bit of background, <clears throat> uh, my name is Kier, Kier de Grand Champ. I'm a home builder. Um, I build in... Uh, Pennsylvania and in Maryland. I've been building for 30 years, but I started doing the zero energy, net zero stuff about 10 years ago, and that's when I got the shot in the arm, uh, <clears throat> like a resurgence. So we at High Performance Home have dedicated ourselves to building at a zero energy level, which means that the house has the ability to produce more electricity than it consumes. Now, I am here as a guest of NGBS because this was uh, uh, probably the reason why I put the formula together through the, uh, the workings of their research center. So about NGBS, uh, the, the National Green Building Standard, which is the NGBS, uh, it's a certification that goes well beyond saying a home is energy efficient. <clears throat> it provides independent third-party verification that a home or they also do multi-purpose dwellings, apartment buildings, land development is designed and built to achieve high performance in the six key areas that they hit. It's site design, resource efficiency, water efficiency, energy efficiency, indoor environmental quality or indoor air quality, and building operation and maintenance. <clears throat> Simply put, creates a better, higher quality place to call your home. So as a home builder, we hit all six of these, these key areas. They're vital to creating a home that can withstand the test of time while delivering one of the healthiest living environments with the smallest carbon footprint possible. In order to meet the requirements of these six categories, we build a home differently from start to finish. We plan different, we use unique products and renewable energies, and we certify all of our homes through a third party to ensure that not only are they meeting these requirements, but they're exceeding them. <clears throat> we build with a methodology that 
we try to build the house like a refrigerator. Uh, <clears throat> once you close the refrigerator door, it doesn't require an awful lot of energy in order for it to maintain to that level. So we use a superior wall, uh, which we can go into more later <clears throat> if you want to ask outside. Uh, so Superior War is a, is a cast off site, not a port in place concrete, has a built in R21.3. And then I go up from there and I use a SIP panel. SIP panel is a structurally insulated panel system. It's solid EPS, gives me close to an R30. So if I'm doing an R21 and an R30, then I spray foam slash um, blow in my insulation to the attic, I'm getting R50. So as you can see, it's a very well insulated uh, product. It's also very, very tight. <clears throat> I want to get down to a um, one air exchange per hour, which is where my energy modeling fits the best. I believe that in Maryland it is uh, three air exchanges per hour, so we're exceeding those codes. But Home Innovation Laboratories certifies that the homes meet the, the requirements of the National Green Building Standard, which is only the residential green building rating system that is approved by ANSI as an American national standard. <clears throat> NGBS provides practices for the design and construction of all types of green residential buildings, renovations, and land developments. They're stringent third party verif they are stringent third party verified certification program ensures that the homes and apartments are built in compliance with NGBS and focuses on three primary attributes that are highly marketable in today's discerning customers. Healthy homes. <clears throat> they provide fresh air, air ventilation that improves the indoor air quality, limiting the pollutants and the contaminants in the home, preventing the moisture problems that can contribute to the mold and attract the pest. We do this through a series of uh, techniques. <clears throat> when we seal the home as much as we possibly can. But when we do that, you have to have a makeup air, which Zender is going to speak on uh, at more intelligently than I am, and I either use an ERV or an HRV, energy recovery ventilator, or now I have a Panasonic fan system, which um, <clears throat> doesn't give me the humidity control within itself, but it does it within holistically for the environment of the house. So <clears throat> we try to do the lower operating cost, reducing the utility cost through cost-effective energy and water efficiency practices, uh, controlling the maintenance costs through durable construction and product selection, uh, we provide technical and educational resources to ensure the home's optimum performance. Uh, we have the <coughs> home help itself. We give you a very nice, uh, well-managed thumb drive that gives all of your warranties and all your critical information. That way you can help the house help itself, and it just makes for a better home. <coughs> By building a home with well-insulated uh, and sealing materials far beyond code, including the newest and most efficient appliances and fixtures, incorporating free hot water systems and recirculator pumps for hot water distribution, using low to no maintenance materials, and equipping our homes with the manuals we just spoke about, able to build houses that have little to no energy supply cost. <clears throat> One of the things NGBS also wants to uh, ensure is a lifestyle, uh, promoting walkability, reducing the home maintenance through enhanced durability, preserving the natural resources through responsible land development practices. The beauty in third-party verifications and certifications to the homeowner is obvious, but not only being told by the builder, but your home is at the top of the performing by national certifying bodies, like the home innovation providing the assurance of it, the third-party verifiers, extra set of eyes, each homeowner's project. It's brought to, <clears throat> brought in to confirm green practices were not only specified and planned, but executed properly. If not, it doesn't get certified. It's quite that simple. As the ANSI approved standard, the NGBS is also required to undergo regular updates by a public conscious process. This ensures the standard is ever evolving and evolving and improving to keep pace with best practices and building technologies. Local baseline codes can be somewhat stagnant. For example, in Pennsylvania, I'm building to a 2009 IECC energy code. However, the NGBS requires a much higher level <clears throat> of efficiency to benefit both consumer and the environment. I'm very interested to see how the smart home technology advancements will continue to play into categories like healthy home, lower operating cost, and sustainability. Currently, we're working with IBM Watson IoT technology to create a package of smart home innovation that will drastically improve these categories and more. So. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Kier. 
We wish all builders had that uh, enthusiasm for building green. Um, you uh, alluded to best practices, and um, I am delighted to now introduce uh, our next speaker, Katrine Klingenberg is the executive director of Passive House Institute US. And Passive House, as many of you might have heard, is um, all about really reducing that energy load and uh, getting the house as efficient as possible. And Katrin will tell you all the good details about that. Thank you, Ellen. I'm not sure I'm, I have enough time for all the good details, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's definitely a very, uh, very exciting concept um, that I have the pleasure to uh, tell you about today. Um, I'm the executive director of the uh, Passive House Institute US, and um, there are a lot of really, really good reasons to design buildings to uh, very low loads, as Alan mentioned. And um, our uh, mission as a nonprofit is to transform the market and to make these uh, strategies and practices uh, best practices in the United States. So uh, what, what are the reasons to design uh, buildings that are very low load? So for one, of course, the energy consumption, we, we bring that one down, cost effectiveness of uh, utilities uh, that you have to pay for your building under operation. But there are a whole bunch of other really good reasons why you want to go to these low load homes. And um, um, some that are very popular, of course, are the increase of comfort in the home. You have no drafts, you have very uh, comfortable surfaces if you insulate your building really well. Um, you have uh, very good indoor air quality because if you build your building very airtight, uh, what you also need is good filtration and uh, dedicated filtration. So um, these buildings tend to be super, super healthy for people who have potentially some like um, chemical issues. For regular people who have allergies, you can, you can trap uh, most of the pollutants that typically come into the house if you um, ventilate just through uh, open windows. And then there's, um, of course, also the, uh, uh, the factor of resilience. Um, you want your building to be resilient if for some reason the power goes out. And these buildings are resilient. They can coast through power outages and uh, stay comfortable for up to five days, even if the temperature is very high in the summer or if the temperature is very uh, cold in the winter. So that's a big plus, uh, right? Um, the uh, Passive House Institute US uh, helps uh, to transform the market. That's uh, our mission. We are um, uh, essentially a standard setting organization. Uh, we train folks um, uh, to uh, put these principles for passive design in practice, into practice. Um, over the years, uh, we were founded in 2003 initially as a nonprofit housing organization and then uh, became a standard setting institute and a, uh, an educational institute. Over the years, we have trained uh, about 2,000 professionals nationwide in uh, using these uh, specific standards that we have deve developed, I'm sorry, um, as well as the um, train people to use these uh, passive building principles. Now, um, maybe a few words to the standard and where the standard is actually coming from. So how do you know where to dial in this energy efficiency? Where, where should we stop? Where, where should we go to with the envelope first before we add renewables with like our goal to get to zero in the most cost effective way? Um, the way we have uh, determined these passive building stands, and again, side note real quick, uh, this is not uh, a German <laughs> concept. As many folks uh, might think, uh, the Germans in the last couple of years have popularized the system uh, very much, but really initially the term was coined here in the United States and Canada, and that's really uh, very exciting for us because there's a long tradition of high-performance, super-insulated buildings in the country. It's nothing new. We, we don't have a technological uh, problem, problem here. The technology is here. The materials are here. Um, so uh, where, do, where, the, where do these standards come from, and how do we uh, dial in this specific level of energy efficiency that we're aiming for? Um, we want to bring the building load down to a very low level, uh, as I mentioned, to create a, a very comfortable and resilient building. And we also want to allow that we can get to zero in the most cost-effective way, which means that where can we dial in the sweet spot between 
energy efficiency and where do we jump off to generate uh, energy through renewables and this is this is a this is a very clear economic proposition if you tell folks they have to hit a certain level of efficiency and it's not cost effective nobody's going to do it so this is really critical that we have the right uh, standards and the right methodology that guides people to this sweet spot between energy efficiency and generation to get to zero and that's exactly where our standard comes in. Uh, we have certain um, energy targets that uh, the designer has to meet uh, when designing a building for uh, heating energy to be consumed over the period of a year, for cooling energy consumed over the period of one year. Uh, we have targets for peak loads, which essentially is kind of like a, a short uh, for uh, how big does your system get to be still. Uh, all passive houses still have small backup systems for heating and cooling. They are not all passive. Uh, and then last but not least, we also have an overall total energy limit that uh, one has to hit uh, because, again, we're, we're aiming at this efficiency between generation and conservation and want to hit the, the, the exact spot. So you need to know what your total energy use is, not just like um, uh, for heating and cooling energy in the building. Um, so the designer then can use these targets and uh, apply various strategies. Uh, passive building uh, really is comprised of five major principles. Uh, first, you insulate the envelope very well. You, you don't have any uh, thermal bridging. Uh, thermal bridging meaning that there might be um, a, a piece of material that goes through the envelope that conducts heat very well. Uh, an example would be uh, a uh, steel beam that goes through, through a facade. It's very cold outside. The beam would conduct the cold to the inside. And if people breathe inside of the building, you might have seen this in older buildings, uh, the moisture in the air could potentially condense at that spot on the inside. And, and sometimes, you, in very bad cases, you could even see icicles in, uh, inside of the building or uh, ice crystals on windows. So um, that, that would be a thermal bridge. So the designer would have to avoid all these thermal bridges throughout the entire envelope. Now the insulation level is climate specific. You want to insulate the building uh, appropriately by climate. So uh, in Texas, it would not make a lot of sense to super insulate a building. Obviously, there you want to find the right balance for insulation between heating and cooling. Um, too much insulation might increase your, your, your cooling energy. Uh, second principle is designing a building very airtight because right now uh, in our buildings we're losing a lot of energy through leaks and cracks in the building. That's completely unnecessary. If we seal our building up, this is a very cheap way to do this, uh, actually very uh, cost effective, then we can avoid most of the energy loss. Um, we uh, also want uh, energy recovery ventilators to keep most of the energy inside uh, in of the building. Uh, we generate inside of the building to heat and cool. We don't want to vent that out of the building. Um, we have uh, then, as the last principles, we want to control our uh, transparent uh, envelope components like windows. So in the colder regions, the passive solar gain would be beneficial in the uh, warmer regions. Passive solar gain, no good, right? We want to employ a shading strategy. So uh, what we provide uh, is um, a uh, design guide, essentially, to dial in uh, your energy efficiency as best as possible. Now, quickly, uh, I'd like to end uh, uh, with um, what, what, where the market is going right now. So far, we've been uh, very successful to uh, get a lot of designers excited to take up this design methodology. And uh, in the last five years, we developed a climate-specific passive building standard together with uh, the Department of Energy. And uh, certifications really have taken off. So Passive House Institute US is also certifying buildings. And initially, that was uh, happening uh, in the single-family market, but now we're seeing multifamily construction uh, to uh, increase exponentially, and even now uh, commercial construction is coming online as well. And that's very exciting for us to see because the market seems to be taking up these methodologies, uh, s not entirely on its own, of course. Uh, and this is where you guys come in, uh, policies and um, developers and those who are interested in this level of efficiency durability, quality, health, uh, they all help make this market go. And um, the way the market is developing right now, uh, we, uh, we're very uh, excited and uh, hopefully we will see this development continue 
uh, we are uh, seeing a, an exponential uptake, and by the end of 2017, we're looking at probably about 5 million square feet certified. Still a small uh, amount of square feet, but the market is really picking up some steam. So uh, thank you for all your work. Thank you so much, Katrine. As you know, as you heard and you've probably figured out, you have to have good products in these buildings, and uh, that's part of this combination that I mentioned. It's all these things coming together. So um, I'm very happy to next introduce uh, Kurt Reisenberg, Reisenberg, sorry, who is with uh, his executive director of the Spray Polyurethane Foam Alliance. Um, and. Uh, Kurt will talk about uh, insulation and, and the roofing uh, uh, system contribution to energy efficiency. Um, and this is obviously a critical part of the building envelope. Kurt? Good morning, everybody. Thought today I'd try something new. I usually have my notes written down on a slip of paper uh, that I, I scribble down before I walk into a room like this, but I'm trying it with the iPad today, so uh, you're all playing along on the new experiment with me. I want to thank the organizers, uh, the uh, House and Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucuses, of course, the Sustainable Energy Coalition and EESI for organizing this uh, today. This is a great event. Uh, it's, it's not often that you can get these types of interests and, and, and uh, representative industries together in this type of, I'll just refer to it as an intimate uh, uh, setting, uh, intimate here as well as in the exhibit hall. But, uh, you know, we come together and talk about these types of issues uh, 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 in our nation's capital. It's a very exciting time, and I just wanted to express uh, how happy I was to be here. So thank you for having us. Uh, quickly on SPFA. So SPFA, uh, the Spray Polyurethane and Foam Alliance, is a 501c6 trade association. We are membership-based. Uh, our members represent the value chain of the spray foam industry, so from raw material manufacturing through to the systems houses, uh, the people that blend it and put all the, uh, the stuff together and the, and the special sauce, uh, through to the distributors, and of course the contractors as the core of our membership uh, by quantity and by focus of our attention, uh, the folks that install this around the United States and to some extent around the world. So having that value chain under one roof does of course allow us to do some interesting things and move the industry a little bit quicker. It also tends to, you know, uh, but when you bring the family together, uh, uh, push people and challenge them a little bit, but uh, overall it's a fantastic setup for us to have. We focus on a lot of technical uh, research and development activities. We have a national certification program that I'll get into in just a second. We have uh, an annual convention and expo, uh, and we have a magazine, quarterly magazine, lots of resources on our website, tech docs, uh, presentations from our past annual conventions. So if you're looking to learn all sorts of things about spray poly polyurethane foam insulation and roofing, our website's the place for you to go. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on spray foam benefits because I think that for the most part people have become widely familiar with those. Uh, unless you've been living under a rock or don't have a television or streaming, uh, it's widely used on things, uh, uh, past show Extreme Home Makeover, uh, Property Brothers, uh, Mike Holmes, all these TV shows have used spray foam. If anyone in the room is not familiar with it, it's the stuff when they spray it into the wall, it looks like shaving cream expanding and coming up uh, off the wall and then it cures and, and, and hardens in place. Uh, between the insulation, uh, uh, their insulation applications, we also handle roofing applications as an industry. Uh, these are different densities and a little bit different material, but it's all spray polyurethane foam. It's all very durable and it all delivers the same type of energy performance. Uh, if you look at, uh, and I will note that there are a couple different configurations. There's open cell, closed cell, some tweener materials. If you have questions on any of the materials themselves or the type of configurations, I invite you to come by our booth and chat with me for a couple of minutes. Uh, but putting all that together, you know, uh, on a residential property, we have commercial applications as well, particularly on the roofing side, but putting that all together, we're going after that 40% energy savings in the home that comes from uh, increasing the R value of your insulation, as well as, which is particularly important, the air sealing uh, of the building. Uh, you, know, you lose a, an enormous amount of energy 
uh, through air infiltration or exfiltration. And spray foam, as you can imagine, when you spray it in, if you've ever seen any videos, it fills in all the, the gaps and and voids and provides very substantial energy savings along with a, an R value of on the closed cell side of around a six, six and a half per inch. So the other benefit of spray foam is indoor air quality. Uh, you've, we've heard that mentioned a number of times here today. Ventilation is of course extremely important as you're building these homes and buildings tighter and tighter. Uh, you know, a lot of things get trapped in there that you don't realize were in there before. Uh, your, your pet smell, uh, your carpet, furniture, stuff in the attic. Uh, stuff in your basement that's being, if you have your HVAC system in the basement, these things tend to get trapped in the house, so you need good filtration and good, uh, good mechanical ventilation as you're making these homes tighter. And of course, we and a number of other organizations have a lot of, a lot of documentation uh, to explain how this should be done. But indoor air quality is extremely important. Uh, one of Spray Foam's benefits, we had Ty Pennington speaking at our annual convention uh, about a year or so ago, and uh, he talked about his mother uh, who has asthma and has respiratory challenges uh, that are uh, triggered by allergens and pollutants. And he spray foamed his mother's house. And she has been in fantastic shape ever since. And that really made him a true believer. Because spray foam allows you to seal the home, keep the outside on the outside, and the inside on the inside, and reduce those types of triggers that are going to uh, make life very difficult for asthmatics. A uh, couple minutes on the, the PCP program that I mentioned, uh, the Professional Certification Program for Spray Foam. It's an ISO 17024 accredited, uh, internationally standardized and accredited program. Uh, this was developed a number of years ago. We rolled it out in the middle of 2013, uh, and this program has been growing since. It uh, focuses on insulation and roofing uh, for the installers themselves. Uh, spray foam is very much as the case for any other technology. It has to be properly installed to realize the performance claims that you're, uh, that you're looking for. And uh, the, the installation of spray foam can be a little bit technical. It can be a little bit challenging. So having a national certification program is sort of an easy button that's been developed and rolled out by all of the elements and, and uh, uh, participants in the industry and the value chain. Uh, along the lines of a standard is extremely important. And we put this together hoping that this was going to provide, as I said, an easy button to commercial property owners, homeowners who don't want to understand the technology, want the energy saving, and just want a, a sense that they're hiring someone uh, in addition to the experience, they have the, the requisite knowledge, skills, and abilities demonstrated by our certification program, uh, as a, again, as a resource to the customer. So uh, just in the last few years, we've had almost 1,500 professionally, uh, fully certified professionals across 45 states. We have most of the preparation, but all of the testing is available online. Uh, we have the participation of 35 manufacturers in this industry. This is not a huge industry, but that is an enormous number, frankly, of manufacturers for an industry our size. Uh, but they're all participating. At our 2017 annual convention, we had uh, 225 written exams and 73 field exams where they actually have to do the spraying, which uh, is more than the combined two years prior to that uh, when we rolled the program out. So that really shows a lot of growth and a lot of acceptance and participation by the industry. So for, again, an industry our size, we're very excited about that. I'll take the minute or so that I have left to talk about the big picture. So all the technologies and intent behind them that you see and hear, hear here today uh, are intended to focus on using the best energy sources to make the most of that energy and use the best technologies available to make the most of that energy and to do it in a way uh, that's sustainable uh, and produces comfort and satisfaction for the users or the occupants. So my background really quick, I also uh, spent in a past life uh, as operations director for the distributed energy resources division of NEMA, uh, where we focused on microturbines, fuel cells, PV, and a whole lot of other things. So I, my background gets to be pretty diverse, and I can see where spray foam, which is one of the reasons I took this job, uh, where spray foam fits as, a, as a, a big piece of that overall energy efficiency and renewable energy puzzle. So looking at PV for just a second, we have a new uh, technical document, which is another reason why I wanted to get up here today, because uh, it does apply to everything that we're talking about. SPFA 150 photovoltaic systems and SPF roof systems. This is a tech doc that was completed just in May 2017. It recognizes the self-flashing properties of spray foam on a roof. Again, we're talking about typically PV roof applications. The, it, spray foam is self-flashing to reduce leaks, water leaks and air leaks around the stanchions that are going to be holding up uh, the, uh, uh, the photovoltaic array. 
This document covers an introduction to PV technology, design considerations, service and maintenance of the assembly, warranty questions, applicable codes and standards, and an overview of the different mounting options. Uh, because just like any other distributed resource technology, you're not going to want to put it on a building that is otherwise like Swiss cheese. If it leaks like a sieve, that, that's a widely uh, ineffective use of the technologies that you're investing in. So we hope to see spray foam more and more coupled with these types of distributed technologies that are going to be able to provide on-site generation or make the most of the renewable generation. So we have a lot of resources. We have AIA uh, uh, presentations that we can do for you, uh, spray foam overviews because people are always looking for those. We have our ISO 17024 accredited program uh, that we hope uh, is a resource to you. And we hope that you'll stop by our booth to talk about any of these resources and where they might fit in with the type of work you're doing. So thank you for your time this morning. Thanks so much, Kurt. And we appreciate you returning this year and uh, being here. Um, finally, I am delighted to introduce John Rockwell. Uh, you've heard a lot about the importance of ventilation. Uh, energy efficiency is wonderful, but uh, if you seal up the building and you don't provide ventilation, that can lead to bad things, sick building syndrome. Uh, so um, John is a technical sales engineer with Zender America, and we'll talk about heat recovery uh, ventilation, energy recovery ventilation, um, a critical uh, new product, not so new, product in uh, uh, sustainable buildings. Hi, everybody. Um, before I start, I just want to find out uh, to know your audience. Before Katrine's uh, uh, description of the passive house requirements, who here is very familiar with passive house levels of building performance? So not a, a huge amount of people. Um, it's a fairly simple standard to meet, and ventilation is not, uh, it's certainly a, uh, balanced ventilation is certainly a required part of passive house ventilation, but you don't need passive house levels of energy performance to need good ventilation. And the architect in me, who uh, for years and years spent endless uh, fees on wondering about crown mold and chair rail heights and symmetry and proportion and things like that, and completely overlooking indoor air quality, assuming that that would just happen, uh, it's kind of a, a bad thing. So, um, so it's good to know who, who your audience is when I, when I talk to people here. I do want to underscore the importance of all these energy standards um, should have comfort as one of the primary goals. All the clients that I had as an architect didn't necessarily care if it used a third of the energy of what they could already afford. I mean, that's important and that's critical for our natural resources, but the first thing I noticed when I walk into this room is not its proportions, it's just how stuffy it was when I first came in, and I think that's true for almost everybody. So we encountered this problem where trying to save energy, the primary way to do that, as Katrina already said, is to make the building airtight. If you stop leaks from a building that naturally occur, especially when there's a difference in temperature between inside and outside and what's called the stack effect occurs, you're going to encounter a lot of heat loss. And so maybe some of you have master bedrooms with 10 recessed can lights that you have on a dimmer, but you go up in your attic and you see that there's, you can kind of see light coming through there. That's a major source of leakage in your house. So the most important thing to do to save energy, whether you're achieving passive house levels of energy consumption or not, is to make your home airtight. And that flies right in the face of what so many building inspectors I've encountered say. You've got to let a house breathe. You have to make a building breathe. You don't have to make a building breathe. People need to breathe. Pets need to breathe. Yes, anything that has uh, formaldehyde in it or off-gassing, whatever furniture is made of and the glues, that needs to be removed from a building. But that can be done in a much better way than the typical bathroom fan. Almost all of us have switches in our bathroom that we turn on, either that turn the light and the fan on or just the fan. But think about it for a moment. If you build an airtight home that doesn't allow air to escape very easily and you turn your bathroom fan on and 80 to 100 CFM are leaving, where's that air coming from? If your fan is removing air from the bathroom, that means it's bringing that same amount of air into the home. Now what happens on a day like today in DC when warm, moist air enters into a cool space. The analogy would be taking a glass of iced tea outside on a day like this. What instantly happens? All the moisture in that air condenses because it's cooled when it gets near that cold surface. And that's what can happen when you don't build buildings properly. Cold air, warm air can come in and condense somewhere in your wall cavity if you haven't taken great pains to make your building as airtight as possible. That's where the resilience factor comes in that Kier mentioned earlier. 
passive house buildings and good low energy uh, consumption buildings are more resilient, they're more comfortable, and that's what we all are going to immediately experience when we do proper building techniques. Now, as far as ventilation goes, the idea of building tight and ventilating right is critical. And when you get low load homes with great energy efficiency, exhaust only ventilation is not really going to cut it. You need to have a way that is quite common in Europe to do that, and that is you meet the intent of the code to evacuate moisture and odors from kitchens and bathrooms with continuous ventilation out of those spaces. But at the same time, you bring the same amount of air through a very controlled strategy, one duct in through the outside of the building. It's an insulated duct, and it goes to a device which you can learn more about on this brochure, which I've left some at the back of the room. On your way out, grab one if you're so inclined. But it's an overview of what a heat recovery ventilation system does. I'm at my booth in the gold room. I uh, uh, don't know what room that is, Tw the gold room, booth 39. And come see how, how that works. But basically, you're exhausting from bathrooms and kitchens. The same amount of air, same volume of air is coming in in a very controlled way. Now, you might say, why don't I just use my windows for ventilation? Well, on a day like today, you would be increasing your air conditioning costs, right? You don't want to leave your window open on a day where it's 90 and very humid. Or even if you live in San Diego, where the temperature is quite nice outside, if you live in a downtown urban environment, you can't really leave your windows open. Or if you live in Brooklyn, you're not necessarily going to leave your windows open. The street sweepers might go by and cause all sorts of contaminants to be able to come into your building. So an airtight building does not mean that it's stuffy. It means that with proper ventilation, you can have superior indoor air quality compared to the outside. And if you go to the lengths of making your building really airtight, for perhaps by using spray poly polyurethane foam, and having very, very rigid airtight uh, or very low air, um, air changes per hour, you're going to need balanced ventilation. So provide air tightness, um, bring fresh air in, filter it as any good HRV or ERV system does, and you will provide superior indoor air quality. Now, who's heard of an HRV prior to today? HRVs, just a smattering of people. Heat recovery ventilation is a means by which when you bring that fresh air in and are exhausting stale air, the two meet in a contraption called an HRV or an ERV. HRVs simply transfer temperature. So if it's 70 degrees inside and in wintertime it's 10 degrees outside during the polar vortex here, you have a temperature difference of 60 degrees. You don't want to use your window for fresh air ventilation. It might feel good at first, but your thermostat is going to recognize that and you're going to use more energy even though you've taken great pains to make your building low energy. In a heat recovery ventilation device, you can capture about 90 to 95 percent of that temperature difference simply by the airstreams passing one another through airtight, an airtight uh, heat exchanger, and as much as 95 percent of that temperature difference is recovered. So your zero degree air as it comes in is warmed up to about 60 to 65 degrees and then is supplied to spaces, keeping CO2 levels down, enhancing sleep, keeping cognitive function and going. It's quite an amazing system. Now, in a climate that has <coughs> severe moisture conditions like we have outside today, an HRV is not going to cut it. You need something called an ERV. That's nothing more than an energy recovery, recovery ventilator. That has a membrane in it that also allows heat transfer from one airstream to another, but also transfers up to about two-thirds of the moisture difference in the air. So if you're bringing in Washington, D.C. air on a day like today, and you have a, a home that's well insulated and doesn't require a lot of cooling, you may have met your cooling loads by air conditioning, but you haven't met the dehumidification requirements, which is really where a lot of the discomfort comes from. If you can dump a lot of that moisture that would otherwise be brought into the house with an HRV, but divert it to the outgoing airstream with an ERV, you'll lower your, your cooling loads as well. And that's how a well-designed, balanced ventilation system can work in harmony with the other aspects of low thermal bridging, good windows, uh, uh, good air tightness, um, and low energy consumption, a low energy budget to make a home work really, really well, or any kind of building, really, whether it's commercial or individual single-family homes, multifamily housing, schools, yoga studios that all benefit from ba balanced ventilation. Any questions? Good. Thank you. Take a brochure. Okay. Say amen to that. Building as a system. And by the way, um, I will mention a resource that I think is, is very, very useful um, called the Whole Building Design Guide. It's managed by the National Institute of Building Sciences, which, by the way, is, uh, has a congressional charter to advise Congress on um, building related issues. But the Whole Building Design Guide, wbdg.org, talks a lot about how all these systems interact. Um, we have a couple minutes for, we have a couple 
minutes until we have to end this uh, panel. So I'll leave it to everyone whether or not um, we want to do some Q&A or you want to take a little, have a little break. There's a question. Uh, did everybody hear that good question, difference between all the different building standards? There are codes and standards, there are building rating systems, there are, uh, it's apples and oranges, there's a, it, it can be very confusing. Would anybody like to, Katrine? Ah, excellent technology. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, uh, um, our trainers uh, generally like to say building codes are kind of like uh, the worst building that you're allowed to build by code. Yeah. Like um, so, that's the kind of like the bottom line, really. And then everything beyond that um, is a step up. Um, there are uh, some standards that that uh, ratchet up the green building aspects but not so much necessarily the energy efficiency. So you want to be uh, looking at which uh, additional standards or rating systems are looking at a holistic green rating program and, and how are they looking at energy. Um, and um, so most of those programs will combine those two things, green building uh, aspects as well as energy. And, and uh, it's up to the consumer then to decide which level you want to attain. Um, so. No, no, they don't. Uh, code, you have to meet code, but and and that right, yeah. But I mean, and then after after that, you you pick what your client uh, would like to go to. Or, yeah. Thanks for that. Good question. Anyone else? Michael. I have a follow-up question on the balanced ventilation front. <laughs> Sure. Yep. Okay. So, a, a house that has maybe built in 1800 and is extremely drafty and has never had any insulation put in it or any air sealing may not experience the regular benefits of balanced ventilation. But almost any home that is built today that has to meet the uh, a lot of energy requirements generally around three air changes per hour even a house around five air changes per hour is done with a blower door test I'm sorry if that means nothing to you but it's a way of uh, testing relative leakiness from one building to another even as, I want to say as high as five air changes per hour our culture has gotten to the point where builders can build in a way where you can get very very good air tightness and if you only use exhaust only strategies you're not you're not getting full effectiveness out of that exhaust only fan. Yes, it may be working. Yes, it may m remove odors immediately, but it may be struggling. The fan may be struggling because you've built the house so airtight, or you'll have to open a window. So below about five air changes per hour is done by a blower door test at 50 pascals pressure difference. You will benefit greatly from heat recovery ventilation. That doesn't mean that the ROI is next year because the cost of installing a cheap bath fan is very low. But it isn't just about electric consumption. It's about comfort. In an HRV system, you are intentionally providing fresh filtered air to sleeping areas. That air in the daytime when there's nobody sleeping generating CO2, that air cascades out of those bedrooms, ventilates the rooms that are not bedrooms, and then makes its way to the exhaust locations, creating an entire scheme of continuous ventilation for the whole house. And you intentionally want to ventilate a house uh, about 0.3 air changes per hour. So every three hours, all the air has been replaced with fresh filtered air, not by opening a window, but by high heat recovery. 
Your second part of the question is, it's a little harder to do in retrofits because you have to open walls and put some ductwork here and there. But if you see, I don't want to get into any proprietary information, but we have a unique duct system that does fit into two by four stud walls. You can come see me at the booth in the gold, in the gold room about that. So, thanks. Question about the ventilation Oh, good. Wouldn't everyone love to walk out with exactly that number to say yes or no? <laughs> yep, no, I'm going to, what I'll say is that if you can make your building airtight and properly insulated for your climate zone, you will reduce the size of your heating and cool si cooling system so substantially compared to the way they're typically designed that there's room left over for a ventilation system. Okay? So I'm not going to give you a percentage. You can calculate the amount of energy recovered by a heat recovery ventilation system and calculate the storage capacity of a cubic foot of air and calculate BTUs and apply a cost to that. I can't do that on the fly right at this moment, but let's put it this way. Anyone who's heard of mini splits and knows that for one unit of energy applied to an air-to-air -air heat exchanger mini split, you get four to five units of energy out of that. With a ventilation system, for every unit of energy you put in, you get about 20 to 30 units of energy saved. So the coefficient of productivity is gigantic with a heat recovery ventilation system. So the higher efficiency it is, the better it is, and that's critical. So. Thank you. I think we're going to have to end on that note uh, and make room for our next panel. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to our panel. Really, really appreciate all of you being here.